Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we are going to look at chapter 8 in your OpenStax micro textbook. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, looking at perfect competition. This is a really exciting chapter. It comes in right after chapter 7 where we talked about firm costs, industry structure, and productivity production. Um, and we talked a little bit about the different kinds of industry structure. And now what we're going to start with is perfect competition. And perfect competition isn't always the most realistic, but it is economists' ideal for a market. And so that's why we start with it. It's sort of what we hope markets behave like. And then in future chapters, we'll talk about other versions of industry structure or market structure that aren't perfect competition that might be more realistic or more common um, and get a sense of it that way. The key terms, there's not a ton of terms. Last chapter, lots of terminology. This chapter, less. So hopefully that's good news. Uh, the key terms in the textbook this week are break-even point, entry, exit, long run equilibrium. We're going to talk about equilibrium in the long run and the short run. Um, marginal revenue. We're going to compare marginal revenue to marginal cost. We're going to talk about market structure more. And that's just sort of how we define perfect competition from other ways that markets might be other market structures. Um, perfect competition being our ideal and what that actually means. And then price taker, which is one of the features of perfect competition. And shutdown point. Um, and so what we're going to be looking at is when firms produce, how they decide how much to produce, and when they decide not to produce in a perfectly competitive situation. And what we're going to find in the next few chapters is that firms behave differently in every market structure. Um, so we'll start with our economic ideal, perfect competition, and then we'll build on it. So grab your notes, grab your slides, grab your book, and let's get started. All right, so here we go, chapter eight, perfect competition. And we start out with looking at why perfect competition matters, why we should care. We'll talk about how perfect com perfectly competitive firms make decisions about what to produce, what the qu ideal quantity for them is. Um, it's going to be based on the idea of maximizing profit. We'll talk about that. Um, and then we're going to talk about entry and exit in the long run. And this gets at why perfectly competitive markets or perfect competition is the ideal because what we expect is um, that there's lots of free entry and exit in the long run and it gets us to this um, ideal level of profit that we'll talk about. And then um, in the end, we'll talk about efficiency in the perfectly competitive markets, why economists like perfectly competitive markets the most. And the real takeaway is because they tend to, in our opinion, maximize efficiency and maximize welfare. <clears throat> so, the beginning of your book always gives a little bit of a kind of a try and make you understand what we're talking about section. And so here we have competition in farming. And there's the example of um, how much wheat a farmer should choose to produce and whether or not they should produce wheat or some other crop. And there's the example of thinking about you and what you might have chosen to do for work at different stages in your life. If you're working now or if you've worked previously, why you might have chosen to do what you did um, and sort of what the pros and cons were. And remember, when we're talking about these kinds of things, when we're looking at the firm's perspective, we're going to be thinking about the pros and cons in terms of costs and revenue and in terms of profit. So what we're going to look at now is how firms in perfect competition or perfectly competitive markets make decisions. And perfectly competitive markets are just one of the market structures that we see. Remember, we talked a little bit last time about the idea that there are multiple market structures. And so market structure is this idea that um, different industries behave in different ways and have different features. And so the market structure is going to be defined by the conditions in the industry, the number of firms or the number of producers or sellers, how easy it is for new firms to enter and exit, and also the types of goods that are bought and sold. We talked about this a little bit um, previously, but when we think about market structure, we can think about the idea that, sorry, grabbing my pens, we have perfect competition over here, and that's what we'll talk about first. And we'll talk about the features of perfect competition, but basically perfectly competitive firms are going to have, or perfectly competitive markets 
uh, markets with perfect competition are going to tend to have many firms producing identical products, many buyers, many sellers, um, perfect information. That's how we talk about it. Perfect information, which is the idea that you have all the information you need. It's easy to tell the quality of a good and the cost of a good. And firms can enter and exit freely. And all of these are going to be essential for the long run equilibrium we're going to get to at the end of the chapter. Um, so perfect competition is sort of the opposite of a monopoly. And we'll talk about monopolies later on. Um, we can talk about monopoly. Um, we also have monopolistic competition. And oligopoly, oligopoly. And so these are different versions of market structures, and they're going to be characterized by different numbers of firms, different ease of entry and exit, different levels of um, good differentiation or types of products and those kinds of things. But what we're talking about today is perfect competition. And perfect competition is characterized by many buyers and sellers, many firms, perfect information, um, the idea that there are identical products, and that idea of free entry and exit. And when we say free entry and exit, what we really mean is it's easy to come in and out of the market. And so my idea of free entry and exit is like if you already have a car um, and you decide to become a Lyft or an Uber driver or a um, Instacart driver, um, it's pretty easy to enter and exit that market as a producer. And that would be an example of free entry and exit. It's really easy to join the market or to start the business. All of these features, especially the fact that there are many buyers and sellers selling identical products, are going to mean that firms in a perfectly competitive market are what's called a price taker. And it's not just the firms that are a price taker Oops, in a perfectly competitive market. Um, the sellers and buy, uh, the consumers are too. And a price taker just means you don't get to set the price. You have to take whatever price is in the market as a given. And so as consumers, we're used to being a price taker. Uh, the thing I always say is it's not like I can go into the grocery store and say, hi, listen, um, I am going to spend $1 on eggs. I am only spending, I'm only giving you a dollar for this uh, dozen eggs. That's the fair price that I believe in. That would be if I was a price maker. I could set my own price. But in a perfectly competitive market where there's lots of buyers and sellers, identical products and free entry and exit, no one gets to be a price maker. They all have to be a price taker because they have to all take whatever the market price is. Because there's lots of buyers and sellers, I can't come in and say, listen, you need my business, take my price, let me name my price. They say, hey, listen, lady, we don't have to listen to you. There are a hundred other people who are going to come in and buy our eggs. So um, that's what it means to be a price taker. It means that everyone has to accept the market price that's given. And this gets back to this idea of Adam Smith's invisible hand. Price is sort of being determined not by any one individual, but by many groups of buyers and sellers making self-interested decisions all at once. And so none of us are going out there and saying, listen, I am only spending $4 a gallon on gasoline. Um, we get told... You can come here and buy this gasoline for the listed price or you could go somewhere else. And in perfectly competitive markets, we see that for both the buyers and the sellers. So those are the, that's an important feature of perfectly competitive markets. Um, so that's what perfect competition is. How do perfectly competitive markets decide how much to produce? A perfectly competitive market really only has one major decision. Because they're a price taker, they don't have to set price. All they have to do is accept the market price. And so what they have to figure out is, given what market prices are, how much should they produce? Uh, they accept the price that is given by the market. And what they want to do is they want to maximize profit. And there are some things that are going to be different in every market structure we talk about. 
and some things that are going to be the same in every market structure. So the how firms make the decision of what the optimal or the best quantity to produce is going to change a little bit from market structure to market structure. But the goal of the firms is always going to be the same. All firms, we assume in economics, want to maximize their profits. They want to maximize profits by having the highest total revenue and the lowest total cost. And that's because that's how we measure profit. Profit is total revenue minus costs. So do we have a graph here? But let's look at an example real quick, okay? Okay, so real quick, we just wanna review where firm profits come from. Profits come from total revenue, minus total costs. And there's a couple of different ways we can calculate this. We can think about total revenue minus total cost being price times quantity minus total cost or average total cost times quantity. Does that make sense? Because price is how much you earn per unit by how many units you sell, and cost is the average cost times the quantity you're producing. Another way you could do that is if you take the quantity out, it's just going to be price minus average total cost times quantity. And that's going to give you the same outcome. And so those are the main ways that we can measure or calculate profits. And so the graph we're going to look at has this numeric example. Let me make sure you can see this pretty well. That's pretty good. Let's do it a little bit more like that. Okay. So these are, this is the example from the book. This is the graph we're going to look at. And what we have here is quantity and then total cost and total revenue. And we can take total cost minus total revenue, or sorry, total revenue minus total cost to get profit. So if we're not producing any units, we still have fixed costs, right? Remember from last time, we have fixed costs like our rent or our insurance that we have to pay no matter what. Um, and we're not earning any revenue, so our profit is revenue minus cost, zero minus 62, negative $62. But as we start to produce, we're going to start earning revenue. And we can see here the price of this good is going to be $4. Because as we produce 10 units, we're going to get 10 units sell for $4, giving us a total revenue of $40. But our total cost is going to be 90 So our profits are still going to be negative. 40 minus 90 is going to be negative 50 Produce 20 units, $4 each, we get $80 of revenue minus our total cost of 110. We still have negative profit, but it's starting to go down. Now we have total revenue of 120, producing 30 units, three times, or 30 times four is 120, minus uh, total cost of 120. Now our profits are almost zero, it's negative $6. And finally at 40 units, we're earning positive profits in this firm. So $160 minus $138 is going to give us our first positive profit of $22. Total revenue at 50 units is 200. Total cost at 50 units is 150. So now we have profits of $50, right? And you can go through as we go on and calculate the profit at any level, oops, sorry, 240 minus 165 is going to be $75. Um, and that's going to give you the total profit at any given level of production. What's going to happen here, if you look at 70 and 80, profits start to slow down. And the profit is the same here. And that's because even though price is the same, because in a perfectly competitive market, our firms are going to be price takers. So the price is given by the supply and demand curve in the marketplace, but total costs are rising. 
And that's that diminishing marginal productivity factor that we talked about last time. The inputs are going to get a little bit less efficient as the firm produces more and more. And so costs are going to start to get higher and higher. And now what we're going to see is profits are going to start to go down. So now 90 units at $4 each is going to give us a total revenue of 360, but it's going to cost us $296. So now our profits are only $64. And if you look here at the bottom, the book goes up to 120. I only made it up to 110 before I ran out of space. But um, here we're at a break even point now. Total revenue is $400. Total cost is $400. So now our profits are zero. And then here we are back to negative profits. In this case, negative, um, oops, this is supposed to be 440, negative 110. And like I said, this is the example in your book. Um, in my version of the book, it is page 190 and 191, figure 8.2. And it's, um, or sorry, uh, table 8.1, and it's the total cost, total revenue, and profits associated with this raspberry farm that we're going to see in the graph in the slides. So I just wanted to give you a look at it before we go to the graph, okay? Okay, so now we can see the relationship graphed. So here we have revenue, and it's a straight line because the relationship is the same at every level of production. It's just going to be quantity times price right? And price is a given. It's $4 for every pack of raspberries. So um, whether we're producing 10, 20, 40, 60, it's a straight line up of 40, 80, 120, 160, 200, 240, 280, etc. Costs, on the other hand, are going to start out low, um, but they're going to start out positive even at zero packs of raspberries. That's where we get that negative profit in the beginning. Um, and then there's going to be a point where we start to see total costs rise at a rising rate to the point where total costs will actually equal, oops, go back, and then exceed total revenue. And that's over here at 70 and 80 packs of raspberries. And then at 100 packs of raspberries, we see that total cost and total revenue are actually equal and profit down here is actually zero. And so you can see here, profit is rising, peaking, and then falling. And when profits are peaking, the space between total cost and total revenue are the largest. So total revenue for a perfectly competitive firm is gonna be a straight upward sloping line equal to the, with the slope equal to the price of the good. And that's because it's this relationship of, you know, Q times four, Q times four, Q times four. So it's going to be whatever the quantity is times four gives you that total revenue. Total cost is also going to slope up, but it's going to have that curvature to reflect the diminishing marginal productivity of inputs and the rising marginal cost, right? The rising, rising marginal co costs and diminishing... Ugh. <laughs> do over. Total costs are going to curve up and increase at an increasing rate to show that diminishing marginal productivity, the diminishing marginal returns to inputs, and the rising marginal cost. Maximum profit is going to occur where the difference between total cost and total um, revenue are the greatest, and that's going to be where profits are the highest. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense. So let's look at how would we find this? How does a firm know where to produce, where profits are being maximized? Well, it turns out it comes back to economists' favorite thing, marginal costs and marginal revenues. We love marginal relationships in economics because we're always looking at the effect of each additional unit. And so to find the profit maximizing quantity for a firm, we want to look at marginal revenue, how much revenue changes as we go up, and marginal cost, how much cost changes as we increase production. So remember, we already know marginal cost from last chapter. It's going to be change in total cost divided by change in quantity. Marginal revenue is the same. Change in total revenue divided by change in quantity. And that might seem complicated, but really, for us, marginal revenue is going to be price. 
right? The change in total cost is zero, 40 minus 0, or 0, right? It's 40 minus 0. And the change in quantity is 10 minus 0. So 40 divided by 10 is 4. Same thing. From 80 to 120, change in quantity is 10. Change in revenue is 40. So it's going to be $4. So our marginal revenue is going to be equal to our price in perfectly competitive firms. So like I said, some things are the same for perfectly competitive firms and different for every other kind of market structure. Some things are the same for all firms. All profit maximizing firms are going to produce where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. What we'll see is marginal revenue is different for other structures, but we won't worry about that now. So marginal cost is going to be the change in total cost divided by the change in quantity. And when, to get to the profit maximizing point, we want to get to the point where total marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. Okay, that's the key to solving profit maximizing cases for firms is we want to find the place where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. So if you look here, we can remember that a price in a competitive market, and all we've talked about so far are perfectly competitive markets. It's going to look like the markets we looked at at the beginning of the semester. So the equilibrium price is determined by the supply curve and the demand curve. In this case, there is a market that is perfectly competitive with hundreds of people buying raspberries and hundreds of farms selling raspberries. And so the market price, $4, is going to be that marginal revenue that we see at every level of productivity. So far, so good? Hopefully. So marginal revenue is given by the change in total revenue or by the price. What about marginal cost? Marginal cost is going to be rising. And I said this in the videos before, and if you are a little bit uncomfortable with this, go back and either review the chapter seven video or take a look at the firm costs video I posted. That's just, um, that's just an example of how to solve these marginal cost problems and calculate marginal cost, because you do need to understand marginal cost going forward in order to be successful in this chapter and in this class. So marginal cost is going to usually go down a little bit at first, and then a firm's going to reach its sort of cost minimizing point, and then it's going to start going up. Um, and so we see that marginal cost starts to increase at an increasing rate, right? And so for the perfectly competitive firm, marginal revenue is a horizontal line that is equal to market price. Marginal cost is going to probably have a little bit of downward slope in the beginning and then have an increasing cost as the marginal returns to inputs are low. And so the profit maximizing point in this case is going to be here where marginal cost is $4 and marginal revenue is also $4. So that's going to be here at a quantity of 80 and profit of 90. And if you don't take my word for it, check out your textbook. Look at table 8.3 on page 194, where they go through and calculate the marginal cost. What we'll see is the marginal, oh, that's not right. That's right. Marginal cost here is the difference between 90 and 62 and 10 and 0. So it's going to be 160 marginal cost at, or I'm sorry, not 160. We'll jump ahead. I'm just copying it from the textbook right now. From uh, the marginal cost of one of the 30th level of production is 160. 40 is 120. 50 is 150. And so on. And then we get to say uh, producing 70 units has a marginal cost of 250. $2.50, and then when we get to producing 80 units, the marginal cost is $4. So we can look at it graphically, we can look at it mathematically. What we want to see, and you can see it here, profits are maximized when marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue, and that's a super important thing to learn from this chapter. So what does that mean? Um, does it mean that 
a firm is going to actually earn profits? And does it mean that a firm is going to earn economic profits? That depends on the profit margin or the average level of profit. And so what we know is this is the right quantity to produce, the right Q, but we don't know whether the firms are gonna earn economic profits or not. And when we talk about profits, remember, we're always gonna be talking about economic profits, which means we're gonna be considering explicit costs and implicit costs. So let's look at some examples of cost curves with marginal revenue curves to see if firms earn profits. So here we have three different examples. We have an example where a firm is making a profit, a firm is making is breaking even, and where a firm is taking losses. And what's the difference? The difference is where marginal revenue is. If marginal revenue is higher than the point where marginal cost and marginal revenue, or where marginal cost and um, average cost are, then we're going to see this firm make profits. So if marginal revenue is $5, the firm's going to produce 90 packs of raspberries. And we can see marginal cost is $90, but average cost is lower. And remember what we said last time. Profit is total revenue minus total cost or price minus average total cost. So if we are selling, for example, 90 raspberries and it costs us three dollars and fifty cents to produce each pack of raspberry and we can sell each pack of raspberries for five dollars and that means we're going to earn an extra dollar fifty for each pack of raspberries so we're going to have 150 times 90 is going to be our profits what about in, let's jump ahead to graph C here. In graph C, price intersects marginal cost below the average cost curve. So in this case, average cost is not going to be at, we're going to produce where marginal revenue equals to marginal cost. It's going to be at a quantity of 50. And now marginal revenue is $2.00. And average cost at that level is still $350. But now that firm's going to be earning negative profits on those 50 units, and that means they're going to be taking losses. It's going to cost them $1.50 to produce those units more than they get. It's going to cost them $350 to produce. They're going to pay, they're going to get paid in terms of prices $2, so they're going to take a loss at every price. In Example B, we see price intersects marginal cost at the average cost curve. This is where the firm breaks even. This is because price is equal to marginal revenue, is equal to marginal cost, is equal to average cost. That's because in this case, if price is equal to average cost, it's going to be a profit of $0. And that's what we consider the ideal in economics because we're compensating the firm for everything, not just their explicit costs, but also their implicit costs, right? Also their opportunity cost of their resources. Um, and so that's where we're going to see firms earning zero economic profit. Okay? So far so good, hopefully. If not, let me know. Hit me up in the discussion threads or email me. Let me know if you'd like an example of this. Um, all right. Let's keep going. So, why can a firm not avoid losses by shutting down and not producing at all? What does it mean to shut down? Or what's the shutdown point? I told you at the beginning we would talk about this idea of the shutdown point. The shutdown point is the intersection of the average variable cost curve and the marginal cost curve if price is less than average variable cost or if price is above average variable cost. So let me give you a graph to show you what I'm talking about. So here you can see two different marginal revenue curves with marginal cost, average cost, and average variable cost. I'm going to go back to my old stylized example, and I'm going to graph it here in color because I feel like sometimes seeing these curves in color helps make it clear. 
So we're going to go ahead and have our same quantity and dollar space. And I've got a marginal cost curve that kind of, oops, there we go, kind of looks like that. And then I'm going to have an average total cost curve that kind of looks like that. And then an average variable cost curve that kind of looks like that. Right? And then we have a couple of different options. We know, decided, this is regardless of where we put marginal revenue, the firm is going to produce at marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. But we have a couple of different options. If marginal revenue is below average variable cost, say here, call this marginal revenue one, that's where the firm will produce. It'll pr produce that quantity and earn that price, but they're going to take losses because they're going to be producing, in the case of the example in the book, um, price is below average variable cost. They're producing at a level of 65. And you can see that here. If we pull it up to average variable cost, average variable cost is higher than price. And average total cost is even higher. So this firm would shut down. They're losing money every time they sell raspberries. On the other hand, if marginal revenue is higher than average variable cost if it's say here and that's our marginal revenue then our firm is going to produce more because again we're going to find marginal revenue equal to marginal cost and we can see at q star 2 they're still going to they're going to have this price which is higher and now Average variable cost two is going to be below price. So they're going to make some money on every unit. And in the short run, when they can't do anything about average total cost, their fixed costs are sunk, they can't change them, they can still afford to pay their workers, buy supplies, those kinds of things, and they'll stay in business. So a firm will continue to operate so long as price is above average variable cost in the short run. If price is below average variable cost, like this pink marginal revenue curve, then they can't even afford to buy materials and pay what labor, and so they will shut down. Make sense? So that's what we mean when we say the shutdown point. The shutdown point is when marginal revenue or price is below average variable cost. Okay? This is a really important concept. This chapter has a lot of really important concepts. So that is the short run outcome for competitive firms in perfect competition. So another way to look at it is to divide the marginal cost curve into three different zones. I'm going to go ahead and start over and duplicate the graph in the textbook. This is one of my favorite graphs ever. I do this graph all the time in intro to micro and even in an intermediate and advanced micro because it really clarifies things. So if we have this marginal cost curve here and we have a average total cost curve that looks like that and a average variable cost curve that looks more like, let's say, that. We can break the marginal cost curve down into three zones, just like the book says, just like on these slides. Any point below average variable cost, I'm going to mark as red. It's the shutdown point and the shutdown zone. There is never a reason to produce from here to here, because they'll be taking losses no matter what they do. On the other hand, if the firm is in between average variable cost and average total cost, they're still taking losses in the short run, but they'll produce in the short run. In the long run, they'll 
leave the market or what we say is exit the market. But if you think about it, think about firms during the pandemic. Um, maybe they had to close down. They stopped paying. They stopped using electricity. They stopped ordering. If you're a restaurant, maybe you sent your workers home. You stopped buying materials, but you still had to pay your rent. You still had to pay your mortgage. You still had to pay your insurance. That's this area where you're not producing, um, or sorry, you're um, you might produce in the short run, but you'll stop in the long run. You still have to pay. You can't do anything about those fixed costs, and so. Um, while you can't do anything about those fixed costs, you consider them sunk. It's kind of confusing. Um, think about it this way. If we have a, I like the example of a restaurant because it's pretty straightforward. If we have a restaurant and we are taking losses every month, but we can afford to pay our workers, we can afford to buy materials, we can afford to buy food, and we can maybe put a little bit of money towards rent, we can't break our lease. We can't sell our property. And so until we get to the long run when we can sell the restaurant or break our lease, we'll keep producing in this pink area. And that's this losses but continue in the short run zone. The break even point occurs right here. And that's what we kind of consider the long run equilibrium. And that's where economic profit is zero. And then up here is the profit zone. This is where firms are earning economic profit. This is where firms should shut down. And this is where firms will, oops, wrong color, produce in the short run. And then here's our Cool? Does that make sense? So the break-even point is the level of output where marginal cost intersects average cost um, at average cost's minimum, and marginal revenue is there too. That would be, if marginal revenue was here, that would be the perfect point to be at. The firm would earn zero economic profits, but that's okay because they'd be compensated for all of their explicit costs and their implicit costs, which includes things like entrepreneurship. Okay. So, if the shutdown point is lower than price and price is lower than the breakout point, um, firms might continue to, if they're in this area, they'll continue to produce in the short run and then they'll shut down in the long run. If price is lower than the shutdown point, there's no reason to produce because you can't even cover materials. You can't even pay your workers. Does that make sense? So, Really use this as a key to figure out what a firm should do in the long run or, and the short run. Because all you need to do is say, where's marginal revenue? And wherever it is on this marginal cost curve, that tells us how much the firm's going to produce and what it should do in the short run and the long run. Does that make sense? This is true for perfectly competitive firms. And there are some great examples in the book if you look at pages 200 to 203, you see really good examples of how that works mathematically if you're not a graph person. So this gets us to the next section, entry, exit, and long run equilibrium. And that's the next sort of stage of what this graph is telling us. Entry is when new firms enter in response to increased industry profits. So remember when I said, hey, you know, if you have a car and a phone, you could drive for Uber at any time. You could drive for Lyft at any time. You could always just decide to start doing um, uh, Instacart or DoorDash. Why don't you? Well, maybe you've heard it doesn't make a ton of money, right? But if you heard people were making $100 a day doing a half hour of work, then you would enter. And that's what we consider this entry point. Everything above the break-even point where firms are earning profits, we're going to expect new firms to enter. High profits are going to induce firms to enter. On the other hand, if we're below this break-even point, we're going to expect firms to exit. Either in the short run or the long run, firms are going to exit because they're taking losses. Long run equilibrium is going to occur here. 
at that breakout point, that break-even point. That's going to be our long-run equilibrium because that's where there's not an incentive to exit or enter. You're not earning crazy high profits. You're not taking on losses. So that is our long-run equilibrium. Okay? Sound good? So what does that tell us about industries? It tells us that we can think about different kinds of industry. We can think about perfect competition a couple of different ways. It helps us sort of understand why this is the economic ideal. Firms aren't earning, earning crazy profits. They're not taking losses. And we can start to break these industries down in this kind of structure. A constant cost industry is going to be an industry where as demand increases, the cost of production for firms stays about the same. It's, it's constant at every stage of production. Increasing cost industries are where as demand increases, the cost of production is going to tend to increase overall, get a little bit more expensive, and that's going to mean that the firms are probably getting less efficient. A Decreasing cost industry is an industry where as demand increases, the cost of production are going to decrease and firms are going to get more efficient. And so depending on the type of industry we're in, if we're in a constant cost industry, we're going to see the long run supply curve be fairly straight. As firms, um, as demand increases, more firms enter, supply increases, and the long-run supply curve stays pretty flat. It doesn't matter how much demand and supply increase, prices stay about the same. On the other hand, if we're in an increasing cost industry, look at this. As demand increases, it's expensive, and a small number of firms increase and costs go up. So the long-run supply curve is going to tend to go up. On the other hand, this is not a very common case, but we can think about a situation where maybe as demand increases, firms actually see their costs go down. They supply more without lots more firms entering, and that's going to see the equilibrium price fall. Does that make sense? And so here we see the description of all these cases, and that gives us a sense of what the long-run equilibrium might look like in perfect competition, depending on the type of cost industry they're in. Okay? So what does that tell us? Where are we ending up? What does efficiency in perfectly competitive markets mean? In perfectly competitive markets, we expect the best, most productive situation. And that's because we're going to see both productive and allocative inefficiency. What? Well, efficiency is good, but what are productive and allocative efficiency? Productive efficiency means we're producing without waste. So we're on the maximum production possibilities frontier that you should remember from the beginning of the chapter. We are producing as much as possible, and we're using all of our inputs efficiently. In the long run, a perfectly competitive market in this perfectly competitive point is going to be productively efficient. Allocative efficiency means that the people who want the goods the most are most likely to get it. And that's the other thing we expect to see in a perfectly competitive market. So perfectly competitive markets are economists' ideal because when firms produce and sell goods at the lowest possible average cost, we're going to see inputs be produced efficiently and outputs be allocated efficiently. Does that make sense? So allocative efficiency is all the points on the production possibilities frontier. We're producing the socially preferred one. Productive efficiency means we are on a maximum point. In a perfectly competitive market, price is going to be equal to marginal cost at that break-even point, and that's going to be where firms are at the optimal size producing the optimal quantity, and that's going to give us the greatest social benefit. So that's what perfect competition is. It's our hypothetical benchmark. It's the dream marketplace. Is it realistic? Not super duper. In the real world, lots of things disturb 
perfect competition. And that's a lot of what we're going to spend the rest of the semester talking about is all the other things that disturb perfect competition. We don't see markets with tons of firms all the time. We can differentiate between different goods. So maybe you can't tell between one packet of raspberries and another, but I bet you can tell between a shirt you got from Target versus a shirt you got from Amazon versus a name brand shirt. Um, I bet you can tell the difference between a Honda and a Tesla. Um, there are issues with willingness and ability to pay. We always talk about, oh, well, people who want things the most get them, but there's poverty. Sometimes you can't pay for the things you need. Technology alters markets. Pollution is a negative externality we'll talk about later, but it distorts markets. Government programs, government intervention can distort market. We can see information not be clear or perfect in markets. Um, and then there are markets where we have monopoly power or too much market power because there aren't enough firms. So what we'll pretty much spend the rest of the semester talking about is how much that even though we want markets to be perfectly competitive, they really rarely will be. And that's what we'll look at next. So that's it. Um, let me know what questions you have, what's confusing, what makes sense. But this is our perfectly competitive market. It's a market where many firms exist. Firms are price takers, but so are consumers. There's lots of consumers and they're price takers. There's going to be perfect information and all the goods are the same. We can't tell the difference. And what we're going to see is this marginal cost curve is going to give us the break-even point where the price is equal to marginal revenue and determines our quantity that we're producing and what our market looks like. Is it realistic? No, but it's what we hope to see. Um, so that's it. That's chapter eight. Let me know what questions you have. Let me know if you'd like to see an example, and I'll see you all next time. Have a great day.